Welcome to chapter 12 of our textbook. Sorry, I had to raise myself up there a little bit uh, so, that, so that you can see me a bit better. Uh, we're going to talk about moons, we're going to talk about rings, and we're going to talk about Pluto. And one of the things I will do is I will post up in our module a couple of extra videos, a couple of extra links so that you can see a bit more about the Cassini mission that was around Saturn, uh, took a lot of spectacular pictures of the rings, and uh, about Pluto, which of course is newly explored. Uh, when I say newly explored, I mean within the last five years. We just had uh, the New Horizons probe arrive there and in 2015, and we had it continuing on to other Kuiper Belt objects, and we'll talk about what Kuiper Belt objects are uh, along the way uh, here this week and next uh, and in just the last year or two, and, and we're, it's still going out there. So, so we do have some active missions in this area, and we have some spectacular things. And of course, when we talk about the rings, we're mostly talking about Saturn uh, in terms of Lord of the Rings, but the truth is all four of our gas giant planets have rings, and rings are not an unusual thing uh, to have around a planet in general. Rings do come and go over time. So uh, one of the things that, that uh, to keep in mind is these are not necessarily permanent features, or if they are somewhat permanent, then they sort of grow and shrink and grow and shrink over time. And we'll see what's fueling the rings of Saturn in our lecture here too. Uh, so let me make sure we can get to the lecture. Let me try our share a screen option that we have here. And ta-da, here we are with our slideshow. And we'll play this from the start. There we go. So we're gonna talk about moons first. And remember uh, when we talk about our gas giants out there. We're talking about Jovian planets. Jove is a word that means Jupiter. Uh, there was an old expression by Jove, uh, which was basically a, by Jupiter, uh, sort, of, sort of a kind of an oh my god kind of statement uh, that some people would use, uh, but, but it's uh, 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 Jovian planets are the larger planets that are out there. Uh, we have major moons, around three out of four of them. Uh, four of those major moons are around Jupiter, which you see here. We often refer to these as Galilean moons because Galileo is the person who first saw them through his telescope in the early 1600s. And we covered that, I believe, in chapter two and three. So if you want a refresher on that, you might go back and look at your, your things for those chapters along the way. But here's the Jupiter family. Uh, we have, again, Io up at the top here. We have uh, Europa, which is one of the top places for potential for life in our solar system. Uh, we have Ganymede and we have Callisto. Ganymede is the largest moon in our solar system. Up against the J big red spot on Jupiter, we can see how large that is, considering each of these moons is larger than our moon or about the same size of our moon. So, so it's, it, these are, 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 are pretty big objects. You can tell that in part because they are spherical. They have enough gravity to sort of pull themselves together. Uh, smaller asteroids, as we'll see coming up in a later lecture, uh, do not. This is a sort of family portrait of the major moons around the planets along the way. Uh, you can see that Earth has a major moon. Uh, you can also see that Jupiter's moons, uh, Callisto, Ganymede, and Io are the same size or larger. Titan is larger. Uh, Triton around Neptune is also over here. Uh, I'll just a little bit smaller, it looks like. Notice that Uranus here has no major moons. When Uranus was, when they were handing out major moons, Uranus was not in line. This is the moon, the major moon of Pluto, Charon. We're throwing that in, even though Pluto is classified as a dwarf planet. Eris is as well. It has uh, no major moons at all. It has a, uh, a smaller moon. 
But if we were to put all of the moons on this chart, uh, this would extend down maybe four or five slides, and so would this. There are more moons than this. This is just a sort of selection of some of the best explored or best known moons. Uh, astronomers, being the creative sorts that we are, uh, classify small, medium, and large moons as small, medium, and large moons. Uh, there are far more small moons than anything else. Uh, most of them are captured asteroids or comets. Uh, some of them are actually fragments from other moons or perhaps even the planet themselves. That's, that's actually one of the theories about the moons around Mars, for example, is that they might actually be Martian fragments from an impact. But they don't have enough gravity to pull themselves together. If you have enough material, then everything sort of goes towards the center. Like, where's the center of the Earth? Well, if you're at the North Pole, it's straight down. If you're at the South Pole, standing at the South Pole, it's also straight down. Everywhere you're looking, it's pretty much straight down. Uh, that doesn't happen if you don't have enough mass. Now, notice these are in kilometers, so we're going to say this is maybe about 10, 12 miles across. This is going to be uh, about the size of, say, a large county in, in the United States. This will be about the size of a small county here. These might be about the size of a small state, maybe like Rhode Island or Delaware. But again, they're very small. Notice the number one thing that we see on them tends to be craters. Some of them are largely cratered, uh, lots of impacts, large impacts, smaller impacts. This one almost looks like a coral piece of coral here. Uh, some of them are smoother, but they still have impacts. Some we don't have really clear pictures of uh, as, as we go along. Sometimes that happens. Uh, but again, large moons, major moons. Uh, uh, in Jupiter, it has four. It's the only one that has more than one. Uh, Saturn has one. Neptune has one. Titan and Triton. Try not to get those confused. Titan is Saturn. Triton is Neptune. The way I remember it is the letter R. There's only one R between the two of them. The R is in Saturn, the R is in Triton. There's no R in Neptune, there's no R in Titan. Uh, but you can come up with your own way of figuring out how to remember that. For size comparisons, notice here's Mercury. It is a planet. Notice Ganymede. Uh, Ganymede is, in fact, larger, just a smidge, uh, than Mercury uh, in, in uh, uh, it, uh, the other moons along the way are just slightly smaller than Mercury, but if they were off on their own in our solar system, not going around a planet, but off going around the sun, they would in fact qualify as planets too. Uh, for size comparison, this is Pluto. This is not Charon around Pluto. This is actually Pluto itself. So notice it's smaller than all of the other major moons, including our own moon. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that they all tend to have ice. Uh, so, so we have H2O and other kinds of ices, like methane, uh, uh, dry ice, and other kinds of things like that. And they all go around in the same direction as the spin of the planet, with the exception of Triton here. It's going in the opposite direction, and we call that retrograde motion along the way. And that's one of the, uh, the indicators that that's a captured moon. Well, let's look at the moons of Jupiter first. We have Callisto, which is a, basically a giant ice ball. Uh, it's the outermost of the great moons of Jupiter. We have, going out to in, we have Callisto, Ganymede, Europa, and Io. Uh, we can see lots of impact sites here. Here's an impact site. Notice we've got this sort of funky stuff here. We call them ice spires. Uh, one of the things that might happen is you might have a, an impact that will cause a lot of heat upon impact. It'll melt the ice that will then wave, sort of a wave function out, and the waves will freeze in place. So we get a little bit of that action happening here. We also have ice flows. Even though ice is solid, it flows. It flows here, and we'll see it flowing on uh, Europa as well. But we do see some uh, sort of permeation here. We do see some evaporation and a little bit of melt that's happening on Callisto, but essentially it's a big ice ball. It probably has something metallic somewhere near the center because it does have a magnetic field and ice doesn't tend to be magnetic. Ganymede, largest moon in our solar system. These pictures uh, uh, were, were, were taken 
Uh, this one was taken by Voyager 2 uh, uh, along the way. So as it was sort of going through the system, didn't even stop to go into orbit, it just sort of shot right through. We have different kinds of terrain here. We can sort of see some, some track marks. We can see some impact craters. We can see some smoother areas along the way. So one of the things that, that tells us there's tectonic forces, sort of like the shifting and moving that we have here on Earth that also creates these things. If we look at a close-up here, we can see that we have some younger terrain and some older terrain. We have more craters over here. We have fewer craters over here. Movement in the terrain will erase the craters. So these are yet newer craters that have happened. This one has a little central peak in the middle there. You may remember us talking about that in the past. So there is some heating function inside of here. One of, them, one of the heating functions is that as Ganymede goes around Jupiter, it's sort of tugged and pulled a little bit. It's further out from it from Jupiter than some of the moons, so it gets just a little bit of that, but as it gets tugged and pulled, that heats it up. When we're looking at tug and pull, that's more pronounced on Europa because it's closer in. Notice all these cracks in the surface here. This surface is completely ice. It's all ice all over. Uh, so this is a, an ice ball, but it's not an ice ball all the way through. It's just on the surface. It's just a surface coating. And we can also see all this brown stuff. This brown stuff is, in fact, sulfuric deposits that have come from largely the volcanoes of another moon, Io. The volcanoes of the other moon, Io, are spewing out the dust and gas, and some of it trickles over into Europa and covers the surface along the way. These cracks are, in fact, cracks in the ice. We have water, liquid water, under the ice. So these are like glaciers and icebergs on top of the water, except it's completely covered here. When they shift, the water sort of bubbles up and then refreezes. But we get these different kinds of uh, ridges around the cracks along the way. We do have a core. We do have a mantle that is a rocky uh, mantle. So we have, just like Earth, a metallic core, a rocky mantle. Then we have an ocean. It's a 100% ocean all around, uh, all around uh, Europa. And uh, what, what we have is maybe as much as 50, 60 miles deep. That, by comparison, our oceans here on Earth top out at five miles deep or so. So the, the oceans on Europa will be 10 times deeper uh, than that along the way, but they don't go all the way down. Uh, so, so we're sort of a regular planetary kind of body uh, with water all over and then ice all over the top. So it's sort of like ice fishing. You go and you can stand on the ice, but underneath there's still liquid water. So just like with ice fishing, there might be fish down there. We do have impacts on the surface that will generate heat into the center. We also have a heat source most likely from the metallic core if it has uh, a radioactive decay. And again, we also have that tugging and pulling from Jupiter. You can see how close Jupiter is here in this, this uh, image. Uh, so, so we have these various iceberg kinds of things. Notice this square here, notice this square here. They're actually flowing within the ice. So the rest of this is ice as well, but some of it is denser than others and there is movement along that the way. We can see that especially true here. We see all of these different uh, 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 ice flows. Uh, the, the, the icy crust lets these kinds of things move around. This happens in our own Arctic Ocean as well because we don't have a solid mass underneath. It's just floating on the water. So that, that happens here. We can see some wrinkles. We can see some crisscrossing. We are likely to land on Europa in your lifetime. There is a mission uh, being put together to land on it. What we'll do is we'll try to land on one of these cracks and see if something alive may have been sort of pulled up as the cracks form and then frozen in those cracks. And so we probably won't find anything alive, but we'll find evidence of life. That's, that's the great hope here. So what we're going to do is have a probe that's going to sort of flow around uh, the, 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 the area here uh, before it chooses a landing site. We're going to look for one of the nearest and newest cracks to land in because we can tell this one here is younger than this one. The reason why we know this one here 
is younger than this one is because it is in fact uh, uh, covering up the, the one below. The ones that are on top are going to be newer than the ones that are below. But as we follow this one along, we see there's something that's intersected it. So this one is yet newer than this one. And we're gonna have to do that kind of analysis here. This whole picture that we have here is about the size of a small county, maybe even about the size of, say, Greater Bloomington. Uh, 15 kilometers across is about eight miles across. Then we have Io. Io is the closest moon into Jupiter. If you remember in our talk last week, we have this big area of magnetic and electromagnetic in energy going around Jupiter. It's called a torus, T-O-R-U-S. This moon is in the torus, so it's getting supercharged from that electromagnetic energy and radiation. It has all sorts of volcanoes. This is a volcano, this is a volcano, this is a volcano, this is a volcano. There are all sorts of volcanoes everywhere. Uh, one of the things uh, it, it, that we, we see when we look at it is 100% of the time, volcanoes erupting, volcanoes erupting. And what volcanoes? Look at this. Here, this is why some of this material lands on other moons. It gets shot out into space. Uh, this one here, this is jetting up 70 to 80 miles into the, the, the uh, uh, area above. I won't say atmosphere because there's not really an atmosphere around Io, but up above uh, the surface. And some of that plume will not fall back because some of it will be pulled into Jupiter's gravity. That's where some of the cloud coloration get, is, is coming from on Jupiter as well. Some of it will drift in the system and land on Europa and the other, uh, the other ones as well. But this, if this is 70 miles up, this is covering pretty much the entirety of Indiana. If, if it, say this were erupting in, in Indianapolis, the ash would be covering the whole state. So that's really huge. Some planets, some moons take hundreds of millions of years to show any real variation in, in the formation of stuff because geology works rather slowly. That's not true on Io, though. When you have active volcanoes, cha things change really quickly. Notice this bl black spot here, sort of the right of center, grew very large here, began to change and shift over here uh, just over the course of a couple of years. Uh, so, so we have major changes happening. When we get up close, we can see pyroclastic lava flows like we have here on Earth that sort of form Hawaiian islands and other such things. Along the way, we have some sinkhole areas where stuff will then fall back down. These are called calderas or pits. Uh, and, and we see that happening all over the place. So this is near the polar area, the one that we just saw in the last image. Then we have this one near the equatorial range where we see sulfuric frost. So, so the stuff that's been sort of spewing out that's really hot will then solidify and freeze and come back down. We have it in gaseous form as it's jetting out in geyser and uh, 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 sort of electro, electromagnetic, magnetically charged stuff. Here's a picture that shows you how I, I said once before, 100% of our photos have volcanoes erupting 100% of the time. This one here, you can sort of see a plume arising here. You can see a plume that we're looking at straight on here. Here we can see a major, major eruption here. Uh, if this were happening in St. Louis, this would cover half the United States here. But then when we look at this image here in infrared, notice we've got one major eruption here, but then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, maybe twelve different eruptions just in this quarter of the moon. That means we've probably got the same amount over here and then on the other side. So we've got like 50 eruptions taking place at the same time. That's huge, that's major. And again, it's in part because as Io goes around Jupiter, it's in that Taurus, but also it's close to Jupiter and it's just a little bit off in terms of its circularity. It doesn't go around in a, a perfect circle. Again, thank you Kepler, who said we go around in ellipses. That's true for moons as well. So when it's closer to Jupiter, it's being pulled this way. And when it's further away, it's being squished and pulled in different ways. Not just by Jupiter though, although Jupiter is the main culprit. The other culprits are the other moons. 
in particular, Europa and Ganymede. Now, Callisto is out here doing its own thing. And that's part of what tells us that Callisto is a newer moon, a newer captured moon of Jupiter. But Io, Europa, and Ganymede have been there long enough that they've influenced their orbits long enough that they're going around in what we call a resonance. They're going around in a pattern. Io goes around four times a week. So Io just takes about a day and a half to go around Jupiter. That's really fast. Think about our own moon takes uh, 30 days to go through all of its phases. Uh, Io is going around in a day and a half. Europa out here, second away from Jupiter, is going around every three and a half days. And Ganymede, larger than our own moon, is actually going around every seven days. So that's still pretty fast. But every week or so, just a little bit off a week, they will line up like this. And this is what Galileo saw. Because when we're, when we're looking at it edge on, what happens is Jupiter's in the middle. Let my head be Jupiter here. We're going to get two over here, Europa and Ganymede, and one over here. And every week they're going to move because they're going around in circles like this around Jupiter. But every week you're going to get two over here and one over here. So we're going to have, have this, this sort of effect happening. And that's how he figured out they were going around Jupiter. But as Io goes around here, it's getting tugged and pulled by Jupiter, but it's also getting tugged and pulled by Europa and Ganymede. So again, twist, 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 twist. And that makes it smooth inside in the middle. Now, of course, Europa is constantly changing because of its ice flows. Ganymede's a little bit further out, so it's not having nearly as much activity. Callisto is really far away, so it has the least amount of activity. Io, close up, we can't even sort of look at uh, an, an icy surface because there is no ice. It's, 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 it's the, the lava flow. We, might, we could sort of consider the sulfur uh, uh, frost as an ice, but, but no, not really, not by what we tend to think about as being ices in our sort of common parlance. Then we have Titan going out to Saturn. This is uh, uh, the only moon with any kind of substantial atmosphere. Uh, so, so, so there's a little trace atmosphere here and there on Triton and a few others. But when, when you see a question that says, what's the only moon with an atmosphere, it's going to be Titan. Uh, so, so, so it has a significant atmosphere. We've actually landed on Titan. Uh, when the Cassini probe went up around Saturn, it had a backpack called Huygens. Remember, Christian Huygens was a telescope inventor and refiner after the generation of Galileo. And it landed on Titan to find out what's there. Uh, it, the atmosphere is mostly nitrogen. That's true for us as well. Has some argon, methane, and ethane. That's what's giving us our colorations that are there. When we look at the atmosphere, we have rain. We have hazy areas where we have different kinds of cloud cover uh, that's there. We suspect there is volcanic activity. Uh, we haven't actually seen eruptions, so we still say Io is the only place with active geological volcanoes in our solar system, but we suspect there are a couple of other places, including Venus, including uh, Titan. Of course, the cloud cover on both is significant enough that we don't tend to see it too much along the way. Uh, but one of the things we can also see is that there's an active surface on Titan. The Huygens probe sort of was, was not a drone, so it couldn't move around and wasn't a rover, so it doesn't move around on the surface. It was just a lander. Uh, but we got some spectacular images as we were getting closer and closer and closer to it. And this sort of shows the descent uh, that's de coming down through the haze, through these mountain ranges here into the valley area down to the surface. And when it got to the surface, we have what sort of looks like a rocky dried up seabed. But a lot of these boulder kinds of things are in fact ice, water ice, H2O, that are sort of covered with different kinds of material. We do have liquid lakes. We do have streams and rivers. Now, these are not liquid water. You may remember, say, hey, Kurt told us a long time ago, there is no liquid on the surface of any other planet except for Earth. Well, that's true for liquid water. Remember, I said liquid water. Uh, this is methane. This is going to be liquid methane and ethane. So when we're looking at the other moons of Saturn, we have 
some interesting things here, including this one here, Mimis. What does Mimis look like to you? I know what you're saying. Aha, yes, that's no moon. Uh, that's a space station, yes. Well, it is actually a moon. And, and this is a big impact crater with a central peak. But think about it this way. Star Wars came out in 1977. And then the Voyager probe came to Saturn just a few years after that and snapped this picture. And everyone's like, oh. So George Lucas knew something we didn't know. Uh, so so, so they, there are some interesting things about moons on Saturn, including this one. I love this one. Uh, Enceladus. Notice this blue stuff here. That is water. Uh, there's a subsurface ocean here, just like there is on uh, Europa. But this is not actually flowing on the water. It's evaporating and escaping for, into space. So it's actually going from solid on the surface, liquid underneath, out into gas. And this is part of where Saturn is getting the material for its rings. The reason why it has these big fluffy snowball rings, this is the reason right here, Enceladus is fueling them. If Enceladus runs out of water, which it will at some point, then the rings will probably disappear. Some of that doesn't end up on rings. Some of it ends up as frost and snow deposits on other planets or on other moons. Uh, here we have the moon uh, Iapetus. And we can see it has a sort of snow cap. We also see this ridge in the equator. That tells us there's also a huge impact kind of thing over here. That tell, Both of those things tell us there was probably some kind of impact between different moons in the past that then fused together into one. Uh, Uranus, again, has no major moons, but it has uh, some interesting medium moons. Here's Miranda. Remember the moons of Uranus? William Herschel discovered Uranus, wanted to call the planet George. Uh, Uranus's moons by uh, uh, convention are named after British uh, literary characters. Miranda is one such, so it doesn't have the Greco-Roman theme going for it. But we have here some sort of smooth areas, some pockmarked areas, some cross hatching and other things. This tells us that there was once upon a time geological stuff happening. In, on the, the moon, but it's small enough that it has sort of solidified, it, it has cooled off, but it's large enough to be spherical. So, so if it were off on its own, it would probably be considered a dwarf planet. Then we have Triton. Triton is the major moon of Neptune. It has had an atmosphere before. It seems to have lost its atmosphere. It still has a very, very wispy atmosphere. So, so in fact, when we say, does it have an atmosphere, you can say yes or no legitimately, uh, in, in, depending upon how you define things along the way. But we see wind streaks from different uh, 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 things that have happened here. We think these are geysers or volcanoes in the past. We don't, again, have any evidence of them still erupting. We have this area called cantaloupe terrain. And cantaloupe terrain, in part, can be like sand dunes, which would imply, again, uh, the different kinds of, of uh, atmospheric stuff. We do have lava areas that are like our moon, that are smoother areas. Uh, and, and we also have some evidence that there might have been water or slushy stuff happening on the surface at one point. We've only ever had one probe go to Uranus. We've only had one probe go to Neptune, and those were both the Voyager 2 probe. And so we only have a handful of pictures from both of these, and we've never been back, and that was 40 years ago. Uh, so there are plans to have uh, uh, probes return, but it takes 25 to 30 years to plan, to fund, to build, and to launch it out into space. So we won't be back to Neptune for another 25 to 30 years. Uh, so these are what we have to look at. But notice these little streaks here. Uh, in, in the, the, and they're all going in the same direction, which tells us there was a, a sort of wind flow going across. Here we have the cantaloupe terrain. We have a few impact areas in this area. But the, the impacts seem to have been erased in lots of, of areas. So we do, in fact, have quite a bit of motion, quite a bit of terrain reconfiguring on Triton. Here's a close-up of a geyser on, on uh, uh, Neptune's moon, and it sort of has the dust that's flowing in a, in a particular direction. Then we have Pluto. Now notice how faint 
Pluto is. It's really hard to see. Notice we've got these two stars in the middle. Those are these two stars here. We've got this double star thing happening up here, which is up here. We have a major star here and here. We have a major star down in the corner uh, here. This is how you would discover planets, asteroids, comets, or other things. You would look at pictures like this and then look for what's different. Can you see that little thing there has moved there? You can sort of see these two stars here. Notice how faint that is. It almost disappears in the second one along the way. But Clyde Tombaugh, it takes a real special uh, talent to be able to look at pictures like this and notice the changes. Clyde Tombaugh was doing this at the Percival Lowell Observatory, and he noticed this was changing around. And so he discovered Pluto which was then celebrated as Planet Nine. Uh, it's since been demoted. Uh, and so we're still in some ways looking for Planet Nine. Here is a size comparison with the Earth, Pluto, and uh, its big moon, Charon. Notice that it's only about the size of half the United States. So it's nowhere near the size of our planet. It's nowhere near the size of our moon. And, and, and uh, its moon, Charon, is smaller than Mexico. Uh, so so we, we, we see that this is, in fact, a very tiny planet. For a long time, they couldn't figure out just how large it was because when it's out there that far away and you don't know what it's made of, you don't know how reflective it is. So it, it took us a while to figure out that it was, in fact, a pretty small thing that's out there. Here's Clyde Tombaugh. Uh, this is the telescope uh, that, that, that he built himself. Uh, here he is at the Lowell Observatory. If you go back to our chapter on Mars, you'll see uh, Percival Lowell looking through the same eyepiece along the way. But Pluto was discovered in 1930. Uh, Charon, its moon, main moon, was discovered in the 1970s. Uh, Nix and Hydra were discovered while we were planning the New Horizons probe. Nix, Hydra, NH, New Horizons, that's not a mistake. We have since discovered two more, which are named Styx and Kerberos, P4 and 5, were discovered after New Horizons was launched uh, towards Pluto. And we were doing studies to make sure that when it got there, it wasn't going to hit anything along the way. Because uh, you've got to tell it well in advance uh, to, to avoid different kinds of things that are out there. When we launched the New Horizons probe, we actually had some of the ashes of Clyde Tombaugh on the probe itself. So he is the most distant human being in the history of our planet in terms of any part of him along the way. When we first discovered Pluto, we thought it was an escaped moon of Neptune. But when we look at it, you see all the planets are going around in pretty much the same sort of plane, uh, the sort of think about it as a pancake kind of thing. Well, Pluto is going at an angle uh, like, like this, 17 degrees. Uh, so, so it's off on its own, but also they are never in the same place at the same time. They have what's called a 3-2 orbital resonance, which means they're always going to be somewhere other than the other one is. Uh, so if, if, they, if Pluto were in fact an escaped moon, you could run the tape backwards and see where they intersected, and that doesn't happen. Oddly enough, Triton, which is going around Neptune in the wrong direction, remember it's a retrograde motion, may in fact become an escaped moon. Because it's going around in the opposite direction, it's unstable. So eventually it might be thrown out of the Neptune system and become another dwarf planet on its own. But various reasons why Pluto got demoted, it's not a gas giant, so it's not like its neighbors. It's much, much smaller than even the other terrestrial planets. Its orbit's really cigar-shaped, in comparison to the others, it's at an incline. It's much more like a comet. It's very cold, 40K. That's minus 233 degrees Celsius. That is very, very cold uh, along the way. We're, we're talking like minus 350 to minus 400 uh, uh, Fahrenheit. It has a very, very thin nitrogen atmosphere that when it is winter on Pluto, it literally freezes and falls to the surface. Pluto is the Game of Thrones planet and winter is coming. That's why we had to have the New Horizons probe arrive there in 2015. Because Pluto, because it goes so far away from the sun and then back again, it doesn't, it's not a, in a nearly circular orbit around the sun in the same way as the other planets, 
That means when winter comes on Pluto, it lasts 150 years. And when winter comes on Pluto, all these atmospheric things that you're seeing here freeze and fall to the ground. So we wouldn't see the atmosphere for another 150 years if we didn't get there before winter started. And winter is starting right now. Now, to show you again how long it takes to do all this stuff, we got there in 2015. We started planning the New Horizons probe in 1988. So think about 1988 to 1998 to 2008 to 2015. Uh, that's a long, long time to plan, to fund, to build, to launch, and get it there. This is actually the reason why we didn't have a probe go to Europa already, because we, we sort of hijacked the Europa probe, uh, the impetus around that to go to Pluto because we knew we had to go to Pluto sooner uh, to get there. But, but, but notice this, this is, this is remarkable. This is remarkable stuff here. When we look at Pluto up close, we can see it's got lots of different colors that are there. Notice this sort of heart shape here. Uh, so, so people made a, a, a sort of a lot of fuss over Pluto has a heart. Uh, we call this the, 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 the Tombaugh Regio, uh, after Clyde Tombaugh as well. One of the reasons why we had problems figuring out the size is we didn't know there were dark patches and light patches, and the light coming off of it from a long way away changed at different times. So we didn't know whether we were looking at something big or small. When we look at it up close, we can see smoother areas, we can see mountainous areas, we can see glacier areas, we can see all sorts of different kinds of terrain. On the, on the surface. And we named a lot of these areas already uh, after things here on Earth. Uh, in, in, uh, we, we can sort of see these ridges. So we know just like on Europa, we've got these ice flow kinds of things that are happening all, along the way. We have sort of ridges that are also mountainous and we have some areas that are impacts. We have some impact areas that are covered in with snow. Uh, so, so some of this is frozen nitrogen, some of it is frozen water. This is Charon, its sort of largest moon. And the thing about, ne uh, uh, about Pluto and Charon is they're going around each other. It's not just one, it's not like the moon going around the Earth, even though technically we're going around each other. The Earth is so much larger, it looks like the moon is going around. These are close enough in, in size that they look like they're going around each other. But as they're doing that, they're keeping the same face towards each other. So if you're on the far side of Charon, you never get to see Pluto. If you're on the far side of Pluto, you never get to see Charon. They're always keeping the same face towards each other, sort of like boxers in a ring. They're always facing each other. They're never turning their back. Uh, so so, so it, it is interesting. We've got this big ridge here. Again, that might in, in indicate two moons colliding into one. Uh, we have this sort of strange reddish polar cap that's sort of caused by uh, solar radiation on, the, on the, the, the moon itself. Then out beyond Pluto, we have lots and lots of other sort of rocky and icy bodies, mostly icy things, only a few rocky things along the way. Although some of those, like Eris here, have also been de described as dwarf planets. Here are some of the ones we've discovered before. Eris, Dysnomia, Maki Maki, Quaror, Orcus, Haumea, Sedna. Uh, for size comparison, here are our two largest asteroids, Ceres and Vesta. Uh, some of these are uh, uh, classified as dwarf planets, uh, as is Ceres down here. Now here it says Eris is even larger than Pluto. That's still being debated because when we discovered it in 2005, we weren't to Pluto yet with New Horizons. In 2015, we got there and people said, uh-oh, maybe in fact Pluto is larger than Eris. But here's the thing, same problem that we had with Pluto, we're having with Eris. It's so far away, we get different kinds of light that comes off of it. We don't know exactly what it's made of, so we're not sure exactly what the size is. Now to the rings. As we look at the planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they all have ring systems. Uh, we do have some moons inside of the rings every now and then. Uh, so, so one of the things that we, we, we can see is there are areas where the rings can be stable or unstable. This is, of course, Saturn, Lord of the Rings. This is taken from behind, so the sun's on the other side, but you can see how bright and vibrant the rings are. 
Remember our word for that is albedo. They have a very high albedo uh, that's there. This was taken by the Cassini probe. The Cassini probe is named for Cassini, who's an astronomer after Galileo, came Huygens after Huygens, uh, came Cassini. Uh, Cassini, uh, Galileo saw that there were attachments like ears to Saturn. Huygens saw that the rings were in fact separate things. Cassini saw that there was more than one ring. So we named the probe Cassini after him. Uh, we didn't name it Galileo because we'd already sent a Galileo probe to Jupiter. Uh, but this Cassini division, in fact, is not just one. We have several. As I was studying astronomy in the early 1970s, uh, we were looking at a bunch of different rings and we were saying, okay, there's an A and a B and a C and a D and an E and an F ring and other, other kinds of rings like that. But as we got closer and closer, we found that they're not solid in any way. They're tiny individual particles, some as small as your fingernail. Uh, they orbit around the equator and they're very thin. So, so, so uh, a, a sort of a typical two or three story building might be as thick as these rings in some places. And then we get this, sort of give up on the A, B, C, D sort of classification ultimately because we've got ring after ring after ring after ring. We've got some areas between the rings. We've got some denser and thicker rings. We've got some thinner rings along the way. This looks like a vinyl record to me. In fact, there was a guy in Canada when this picture was released who pressed the, the vinyl in with the image of Cassini. He wanted to put it on his record player and hear the sound of the planet. So he pressed the image of Cassini onto the vinyl, stuck it on his computer or st stuck it on his, his uh, 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 record player and then played it through and it sounded like <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, not, not gonna be a hit anytime soon. Uh, you, he did record it to his computer and I think it's uploaded to YouTube so you might be able to actually hear the sound of static that's coming from it. Here's the ring from above. Uh, so the sun is looking down at it, so you're getting high reflectivity. These are the rings from below. So even with the sun on the opposite side, you're still having a high illumination. I've shown this picture before, I believe, uh, and, and these are the different particles. We sent the Voyager 2 probe through the rings. That was a big risk because again, Voyager 2 is the only probe that's ever been to Uranus and Neptune. Had it hit something in the rings, it would have smashed equipment, it might have tumbled out of control, might have at the very least dented or damaged the, 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 the signaling devices, the antenna and other things, and we'd lose contact, and that's just as the, uh, as, as the same as, as losing it altogether. When it went through the rings, it didn't hit anything. There's so much empty space between these things, it didn't hit anything. Then near the end of Cassini's life, we sent it through the rings again and again and again and again and again. It never hit anything. There's a lot of empty space out there. The rings are in part influenced by Saturn's gravity. In part, they are uh, fed by material from the moons, but in part, they're also directed by other moons. We have shepherd moons, which are pulling on the material and pulling it into a particular spot that will be equidistant gravitationally between Saturn and the moon. So of course, Saturn being much larger, the moon being smaller, but Saturn being a little bit further away, the moon being closer, there's going to be a calculation at the point of where things are. Sometimes those form gaps, sometimes they form rings, and we can tell from the rings and the gaps where other moons we haven't discovered are. Here's a moon, we call this a gap moon, in the middle of a gap here. We can see another one just on the regular photo uh, that's there. So there are some moons within the rings, and as they're going through, their gravity is pulling stuff together. Here we have another shepherd moon. Notice we've got an oblong kind of, of shape here, a lot of them smaller moons of, of uh, Saturn. A lot of the smaller moons of all of the outer planets are more like asteroids. These gaps, see if we have a gap here, we're going to have Saturn on one side over here, and we're going to have a moon over here on the other side, and they're, they're going to sort of be tugging on each other. So this big of a gap tells us there's probably a pretty big moon over here. This is probably the resonance gap of Titan, the largest moon. Then we have Enceladus. I mentioned this before. Notice these stripes that are here, the water that's flowing off of it. These are called tiger stripes. 
And these tiger stripes, notice for size comparison, the whole of, of uh, England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland over here, uh, Enceladus is not even as large as all of that. So this is a small moon. Even though it's a small moon, it probably has as much water, if not more, than the entire planet Earth because uh, that water may be deep that, that's down there. That is entirely possible. Uh, but these are geysers or water volcanoes. So again, not active geological volcanoes uh, in terms of lava and magma, but they, they are spewing out water, H2O, that form part of the rings that's out there. Then we have rings around other planets here, rings of Uranus. The rings of Uranus are in fact sort of on its side, just like Uranus is. They're not very distinct. There's not a lot of material there. And then, of course, the rings of Neptune, we have uh, just barely a faint hint of those. And we got those from Voyager 2 as well. We had actually seen the rings of Uranus before we knew it had rings. We thought it was camera glare because, of course, Uranus being on its side, we're seeing the stuff around it, and we just thought it was camera glare. So we did, in fact, see them before we knew we were seeing them along the way. But these are formed from dust particles and other uh, uh, impact debris. Uh, they're not just left over from when the planets formed because they would have fallen into the planet or been scattered uh, by, by the gravitational forces before then. So there needs to be a continuous replacement. Uh, that's one of the things that we see with Enceladus. The tiger stripes are continuously replacing any of the ring particles that then dissipate away. So, but the most likely thing for anyone who doesn't have a water moon that's spewing out the ice like Saturn, uh, which would mean Jupiter and Uranus and Neptune, is when moons impact each other. So, so that happens actually more often than you'd think because these are big planets with a lot of gravity, especially around Jupiter. It's close to the asteroid belt, so it's gonna pull in things. Sometimes these moons uh, get hit by things and they actually form other moons in addition to this stuff. Mo over time, most of the debris around the rings will disappear. Saturn, we're in a lucky, condition because Enceladus keeps putting out more. Eventually when that runs out, uh, Saturn will probably also go back to looking like the other major planets that are out there as well. Not quite as spectacular in terms of rings. We have no idea how long that will take. It could take 10 million years, it could take 100 million years, it could take 2 billion years. We have no idea. But just like the big red spot on Jupiter, we have no idea how old it is. It may be 300 years old, it may be 3,000, it may be 3 million. We simply don't know because we only know we've been seeing it for 300 years. We don't know how old the rings are on Saturn. We're going to guess that they're a little older than 300 years. Uh, so so we're, we're, we're going to guess that they're at least 10 million years old. They could be much older than that. But how long they're going to last, again, we don't know. It depends upon the water coming off of Enceladus. They could be gone within 100,000 years. They could last another 2 billion years. We just don't know. But it is an accident of our time, just like the big, moon, uh, the big spot on Jupiter. Uh, so this is it for chapter 12. Uh, join me next time. I believe our next one is going to be on uh, asteroids, comets, and uh, meteorites. Uh, let me verify that here if I can for a moment. Um, so chapter 13 is comets and asteroids, the debris of the solar system. And we've already been talking a little bit about that already. Uh, one of the things that happens is comets and asteroids get captured by these outer planets. And so quite a number of the moons are in fact captured asteroids. Sometimes they get captured and they spiral in and they become lunch. And we've seen that happen uh, a couple of times with comets uh, on both uh, 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 Jupiter and uh, Saturn, much more dramatically on Jupiter uh, uh, along the way. But we also keep finding more and more moons as we look for these, and when, uh, the definition of a moon is something that's so also up in the air. Are each of those little particles going around Saturn here supposed to be classified as a moon? 
Right now, Saturn has more moons. We just announced a couple of months ago the, the sort of discovery or at least confirmation of 20 more moons around Saturn. So if you're looking for confirmation of how many moons there are around these planets, you need to sort of go to a NASA website or one of the, the, the sort of latest websites uh, along the way. Uh, let me see if I can pull up NASA here. NASA.gov. Um, and let me share my screen here again uh, so that you can see that I don't need that. Don't, don't, don't cancel us. Thank you. Uh, if you go to the NASA website, uh, which is uh, nasa.gov again, and type in moons of Jupiter, I can't see what I'm typing because that's in the way. Uh, uh, well, okay, Jupiter. And you search for it, and it takes a minute. Uh, you have some recommendations. You have some space images. Uh, here we have something. Astronomers discover 11 more small moons of Jupiter. And we can sort of click on that. We can see 2002. So that's a little bit old news uh, along the way. So, so we've got different kinds of images that are along the way. Uh, we can say. Uh, sort of how many moons, let's say Saturn moons. Saturn moons, let's look at their ocean worlds in our solar system, that's a good one. In fact, that would be a good final project uh, here, coming, coming to this along the way. And hey, here we've got our, 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 our tiger stripes and, and ice geysers from Enceladus that are there. Uh, we're also uh, sort of seeing the subsurface ocean that, that's taking place there, then we have our Europa images that are there. Uh, so, so, so there are some interesting stuff that's uh, all, along the way. You'll see some related things that are over here related and the latest information that comes along the way. So there's quite a lot of stuff for you to explore on the, the, the NASA website. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit tricky to discover exactly what kind of information you're looking for. Uh, but if you go to the solar system and beyond, planet moons and dwarf planets over here, sometimes it can take just a little bit of time. Hello, thank you. Uh, so, so we do have uh, sort of facts and figures along the way, dwarf planets, other moons. So let's go to other moons. Uh, for our facts and figures. Eight planets, five dwarf planets, more than 200 moons, 957,000 asteroids, 3,600 comets uh, uh, along the way. So 10 things you need to know about our solar system, uh, in-depth, different kinds of stuff along the way. So if we look at, again, moons, more than 150 known moons, uh, so, so Venus and Mercury are the only ones with no moons. Uh, so, so we have all sorts of stuff that you can explore, again, on the NASA website. Please do take advantage of that. And I will see you next week for more stuff.